and, and I'm going to have to follow my notes, uh, but feel free to interrupt any time and ask questions, add comments, but I'm going to be talking about uh, not so much about no-till per se, We've, most of you are familiar with the benefits and the practices involved in no-till, but, but with incorporating additional crop rotations and cover crops within that, uh, that system. Um, let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to start out by explaining to you what our soils look like in, in northwest Tennessee. We're, our topography is flat. We farm along the Mississippi River and the meanderings, old meanderings of the, of the, of the river, uh, between the, the river and the bluffs. We have uh, our soils range from crevasse sands to heavy sharky clays, often within the same field. But we have a preponderance of, of the silty and clay loams. Uh, we try our best to be about 90% no-till in any given year. We work the ground as we need to to heal traffic ruts from wet, from wet harvest, irrigation tracks, compaction, or to manage excessive crop residue. This uh, picture of, of, of our uh, location, we farm right, we farm, oh, what did I do? Uh, you push the forest up. Okay. Yeah. We farm right in this area here uh, between the Mississippi River and the Bluffs. It's a narrow strip, but it, it's, it's very flat, delta type soils. We have more problem getting water off than we do getting it on. Um, I think it's yeah. There you go. It'll take me a minute. I'll get it. We farm about 4,500 acres. Our crop mix consists of 25 to 50% of our acres in cotton, wheat, 10 to 20%. Soybeans 15 to 25, and corn 25 to 40. Uh, that changes from any given year, just based on uh, commodity prices and, and what our rotation, uh, where we are in our rotations. Uh, we've been involved in no-till production. Uh, we've been involved in no-till production since the mid 1980s, starting with beans planted uh, behind wheat. Early in the 90s, we moved into no-till production of cotton and corn. Following the lead of UT researchers, we developed our own shielded sprayers and herbicide programs depending heavily on pre-emerged herbicides and post-directed sprays. Throughout the 90s, we experimented with various row widths from 38 to 30 and 15 inch spacing to skip, and skip row patterns in cotton to 15, 19 inch spacing in corn and drilled 15, 19 inch spacing in soybeans. Currently, we're planning on 38 inch row cotton 19 to 38 inch row corn, drilled to 19 inch soybeans, we drill our wheat, and we either drill or broadcast our cover crops. A 38 inch row pattern, sorry. A 38 inch row pattern allows us to use no-till and minimum till production systems while maintaining beds as needed. 19 inch corn allows us to follow cotton while keeping the existing row patterns it also allows for more uniform seed spike placement while producing a quicker canopy and better weed control. In soybeans, 19 inch spacing allows us to again maintain the existing row patterns and lets us use a planter rather than a drill, giving us a more uniform seeding depth. And the drill is always available to help us catch up when we get behind. From from the early 90s to the mid 2000s, we were predominantly cotton with little crop rotation. Today we plant cotton for three to five years, rotating corn and wheat and beans for one to two years each. Uh, this is a picture taken this fall of a wheat field planted in behind cotton, uh, behind corn. We've seen immediate benefits from managing her, uh, in managing herbicide resistant weeds uh, with the change up of chemistry and the different modes of action. We've also seen an increase in organic matter, moisture holding capacity, and a reduction in seedling disease. Increased crop rotations have allowed us to stay more responsive to changing commodity markets and diversify our risk. Over the same period, we've seen noticeable increase in our yields across the farm. On average last year, we, had, we yielded 200 bushels of corn, 60 plus bushels of beans, and 98 bushels of wheat. And if you look at the, uh, the five and 10 year averages there, you'll see a, a steady, uh, steady increase over the, from the 
five over the 10-year average, and then uh, the last year's yields. Uh, cotton, we yielded about 1,250 pounds last year. Again, seeing a steady increase over the last 10 and five-year period. Clearly, not all the increase in yields can be attributed to crop rotation, but we're convinced that it plays a significant role. In addition to increased crop rotation, we're once again experimenting with cover crops. We initially used wheat as a cover crop in the early 90s to control wind and sand blasting and increase both organic matter and moisture holding capacity of our soils. Ironically, it was the cool, wet soils at planting that led us to give up on our cover crops at that time. However, with the advent of herbicide resistant <coughs> weeds, um, following the lead of Larry Steckel in the University of Tennessee, we've taken another look at utilizing cover crops to shade the ground during planting and, uh, I'm sorry, to, to shade the ground during planting and crop emergence. The thought was that if we could shade the soil, we could delay pigweed emergence. Our experience has been mixed. We found that where we're able to establish an early stand and develop significant biomass, that cover crops are an efficient uh, tool in delaying the emergence of pigweed. Also, they have the benefits of, as I said before, increasing moisture holding capacity of the soil as well as overall organic matter. In the case of cotton, we see healthier plant emergence, perhaps due to less environmental damage from things such as sand blasting and, and wind whip. However, the drawbacks are somewhat the same as the advantages, because in heavier soils, the ground can stay too cool and wet for healthy seedling emergence. In heavier, wetter soils, uh, we tend to see an increase in seedling disease. Um, and, and less uniform stands. Another limiting factor to effectively using cover crops is the logistics of getting the crop out of the ground with adequate time to establish a stand and develop significant biomass. So at this point, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we establish our stands. Behind light residues such as cotton or soybeans, we use a drill it's an effective, as an effective tool. However, the date of harvest can be a limiting factor. Ideally, for our location, we need to have our crops in the ground by the end of October, and sometimes that is too late. <coughs> Behind heavy residues, such as corn or wheat and bean double crop, where the wheat straw has not been burned off, we have good success using an airflow spreader, broadcasting uh, the, the seed, followed by very light incorporation with the vertical tillage tool. We use a Great Plain Turbo Max. We set the depth to one inch, and the pitch on the ganks from zero to three according to soil type. This provides a good sizing of existing crop residue while preparing the seed bed, uh, preparing the soil for the next crop of cotton and corn while incorporating the cover crop to approximately a half inch deep. This is a picture of uh, ryegrass, uh, cereal rye planted into uh, standing I'm sorry, this is a picture of uh, cereal rye planted following a cotton crop. Um, it was drilled. Uh, the only preparation was we sprayed Roundup over it before we planted it. This is a picture of the seedling emergence within that same field. We've had good success with either method, drilled or broadcast, if completed early enough to achieve a good uniform emergence. As, soil t as to soil types, we've seen our best results in our lighter, well-drained soils, silt loams, sandy loams. A variety of cover crops are available. We focus primarily on three different types. Cereal rye, which provides excellent height and biomass if planted early and relatively easy to kill and plant back into. Vetch, a legume that we've found to provide significant source of nitrogen, however, the biomass when planted alone has not provided uh, sufficient shade to shade out the pigweed. Wheat, which is readily available and inexpensive, is a better choice when planted late. It's better vigor in the cooler, wetter condition of late season planting. However, it's a bit more difficult to kill and could require additional applications of burn down. My preference when using rye or vetch is to combine the two but we've had good success using wheat alone, and it's usually sitting in our storage bin and readily available at a cheaper price. Uh, 
you can see uh, the rates we use, 60 pounds of rye, 20 pounds of vetch, and 90 pounds of wheat at a uh, comparative cost of 22, 36, and 10 and a half dollars. If we, when we combine these, we'll cut the rates back by 10 to 20 percent each. After planting a cover crop, all that's required is to apply a burn down a week to 10 days ahead of planting. We've applied our burn down successfully at planting, but normally use Roundup with dicamba if applied early enough, followed by gramoxone with cotteran applied closer to planting. This is a picture of a, the next three pictures are of the same field planted at different times. Uh, this was early to mid-October. You can see there's a, a good development of biomass. It was broadcast into a cotton field where we'd gone in and cut the stalks. Uh, after we broadcast it with an airflow uh, rig, we came back with TurboMax and did a very light incorporation. You can't see the residue that's on, left on the top of the ground, but it's significant. You can tell by the stalks that we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't actually turn the soil. We're just, just sizing the residue and lightly incorporating the, the seed. We've got enough biomass here to help shade out winter annuals, and certainly we'll get uh, we'll get very good shading, and and, uh, and it'll prevent the emergence of pigweed at planting from the uh, from the, the the wheat that the dead wheat that'll be there on, on the surface. The next picture is the same field planted about two weeks later. We got a rain. We had a, had a wet fall. We got a rain. We tried to come back in and do some more of this. This again is is a broadcast with the Turbo Max run behind it, you get a little better idea of the amount of residue and the, uh, but we've got a good stand here. We'll, we'll get plenty of shading. This will come on over the winter and, and we'll get, get a good stand and, and good cover going into the spring, but it's not really enough to shade out the, the winter annuals. And the last picture uh, was right at the end of November. We finally gave up. It was just getting too late to be planting cover crops. Um, on the left, you see our, our typical no-till uh, production. What we did here is we came in and we, we sprayed Roundup and Valor in December, early December. We got a warm, dry spell. Uh, we sprayed Roundup and Valor. On the right, we've got the wheat. We'll come back in in the spring, right at planting. We'll spray Cotteran and Gramoxone over the whole thing. The only difference is that on the right, where the wheat is, we'll have to kill it with Roundup uh, 10 days, maybe two weeks ahead. If we have dicamba cotton, we, we planted a lot last year. We really liked it. Uh, the varieties, we had good success on this field in particular. We'll come back in and add dicamba to the mix at planting. Uh, if that's not available to us, we'll probably try to add some dicamba early on with the Roundup. This is a picture of the TurboMax that, that, we've, uh, that I've been mentioning. And so along with increased crop rotation and cover crops, in the last couple of years we've started using this tool to help manage residue and prepare a seed bed while maintaining the bulk of our crop residue. We're using a vertical tillage tool called TurboMax from Great Plains. The characteristics of most vertical tillage tools is that the blades are straight, not concave, and the gangs have a minimum pitch. This reduces lateral movement of the soil, reducing potential compaction. We run this tool at a maximum depth of two inches and vary the pitch of the gangs from zero to four degrees depending on the soil types. The result is we're able to size the crop residue with minimal incorporation and loosen the top soil within the planting zone without turning the soil over. The process maintains soil cohesion and doesn't bring up additional weed seed while both preparing a seed bed and promoting the breakdown of crop residue. We use this tool to incorporate cover crops to manage heavy residue after harvest and prior to planting. Looking at the picture, the next picture, you would think it was a no-till field. This was this was a corn field that I ran this fall uh, with turbo till, and this is a picture of, of what what the ground looks like up close. You you, you hardly tell the soil's been disturbed at all. It leaves 90% of the residue right on the surface. Now we can. We can adjust that. This this has hydraulic adjustment on the wings. We can fold those wings back to about six degrees and make it look like a plowed field. But that's not the intent of this tool. The intent is to 
just size size the residue, make it more manageable to plant into, and uh, loosen that that top soil, may, maybe an inch, maybe two inches if you're planting corn or beans. But for cotton, we'll run it an inch deep, and it's it's been a very effective tool. We we use it in the fall, and we use it in the uh, spring. So technically, I guess that makes us not no-till, but you really just can't tell the difference. If you walk in the field, you just you wouldn't know the difference. And that gets us to, to my conclusions. The bottom line is that the cover crops and, uh, and crop rotations have, have added a dimension to our, our production that, that definitely increase our soil moisture holding capacity. As Cater was talking about, you know, you've got a blanket on the soil to, to uh, regulate the, the changes in temperature to hold moisture in the soil, that can be a plus and a negative. You just got to weigh it on your farm and, and figure out how to, how to manage it, which we've seemed to have done fairly well. Uh, we're going to increase the organic matter, and we're looking at organic levels from 1.7 to 2.7 in our, in our in, even in our sandy, silty loam soils. Um, overall, include, improve soil health. I think Cater covered that pretty well. We see a lot more uh, just anecdotally, we'll dig in the soil. We, we I, I can't dig anywhere without digging up earthworms, you know. So, so they're they're healthy and living and crawling around down there. And of course, we get the the, the existing root patterns. We hadn't really discussed that, but that's part of our no-till philosophy: is planting on the same row patterns, utilizing those those pathways that the roots create. Um, we control. Uh, we're getting weed control from crop rotation. I sat in on a discussion this morning and they were talking about the uh, change in chemistry and different modes of action uh, that it was as important to combine those changes within a single application as it is to get them from uh, rotating crops and having them at different times and I think that's that's significant and worth mentioning but nonetheless from from rotating our crops uh, and changing up that chemistry, uh, the same things we've been doing over and over with cotton, going to corn uh, to a lesser extent with soybeans, but we're getting different modes of action and different different control methods. Uh, we, we're seeing pretty good weed control. I mean, I you know we not trying to brag, but but we're we're managing pigweed. I mean, we just we we ha we'll have a breakthrough here or there, but you know our fields are staying clean. And you know I'm real proud of it, but it's it's taken a lot of work, and it really takes an effort. I mean, you, you can't cut corners. Um, and in addition, discussing uh, weed control in, in this uh, this crop rotation and, and cover crops, the the um, the cover crops have been effective at controlling the emergence of pigweed at planting. We plant into these cover crops. And we're we're not getting that early emergence of pigweed. They, they're just not coming up. They're not breaking through. If you get a, a good heavy stand of, of cover crop. Now for us, heavy means about knee knee high. We're in the northwest corner of Tennessee, and you know we're not seeing the six foot ryegrass that they are down in Mississippi. We just don't get that. We don't have the we don't have the time frame to establish a stand and, and get that kind of growth. As a matter of fact, that field I showed you, Larry tried the first year he tried to put cover crops in we didn't even get a stand so it, it goes to timing and 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 you know everything's got to work right for you but but once you figure it out it, it does work we, we've got we get rye grass knee high and and kill it and wheat knee high and kill it and it's it uh, shades the ground and helps provide that weed control it's not a standalone we still got to use pre's and we still got to use post applications but it's just another tool to, to help control those weeds Less seedling disease in our sandier, siltier loam soils. Uh, we do see less seedling disease uh, through crop rotations um, and the use of cover crops. The cover crops provide uh, shelter from the wind and the sand blasting, the, uh, which is all part of that complex. But but uh, the the, uh, the the crop rotations, uh, we we feel like we're interrupting the development of the pathogens in the soil that that occur from year after year of the same crop, uh, and and so we've seen a reduction in our seedling disease. And finally, talking about redu reduced 
reliance on PPOs. We've relied heavily on PPOs over the last few years and still do, but we're recognizing resistance, the resistance that's developing within that class of chemistry, and we're trying to figure out how to change what we're doing. Um, I think as Ford Baldwin once said, if, if you get something that works, change it. And so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we've been using PPOs early, and then late in the season is a lay-by, and even in the fall for, for a, uh, a fall burn, uh, fall uh, burn down and control. So the cover crops, and even without the cover crops, we're trying to get away from the spring applied PPOs. One thing we're seeing, well, I mean, that, that's in order to, to, to maintain them and, and their usefulness later on. But one thing we're seeing is a reduction in what we were identifying as um, Bryzoctonia. We think it was probably the, the reflex or the valor in the soil and after a heavy rain we were getting some leaching on these tender young uh, seedlings that was causing them to uh, exhibit signs that we were identifying as rhizoctonia. Th those are just some, uh, those are various thoughts on, on what we're doing and and uh, be glad to answer specific questions or, or clarify anything if, if anybody has any questions. We've got about okay. 10 minutes, so take advantage of the fact we've got yes, sir. Do you do any furrow irrigation? We do. Uh, How do you manage that with your cover crop? Well, I, on those fields, I, ha I, I haven't tried cover crops on those. We've just, we've just got into land leveling and establishing beds in the last three years, and I haven't got to the point where I'm, have, I've got one field that we're going to no-till. Uh, we, we, one of the fields we planted cotton on uh, two years, and we're going to no-till cotton this third year and I haven't tried cover crops on that farm. Let me clarify, we farm 4,500 acres. Cover crops represent just a tool for us and only on a portion of our ground. As I said, our heavy soils, we avoid them, but on our lighter, sandier soils, that's, you know, we're probably using it on 600 acres right now. And that goes to what we can get in after we harvest, where do we need it, sandier, siltier soils. So we haven't tried cover crops on uh, furrow irrigation, although we are trying no-till. Uh, we will be no-tilling into a cotton field. We've got good beds left over from last year, no compaction, so we'll go in this year and, and plant the cotton on the no-till and, and furrow irrigate. Uh, our other couple of fields, uh, we're still in the process of establishing beds and uh, paratilling under them and rehipping, so that's that's that 10 percent of the farm that, that we're conventionally tilling, but the, the goal is to get that back to no-till rotation. We, we just did our land leveling about three years ago. John, I've got a question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your thinking about why you run three years of cotton and then a couple years out of cotton and then back instead of going back and forth. What's your thinking on that? Well, we're cotton farmers. Right. <laughs> I want to raise cotton. Uh, that's part of it. So um, and, and my father, uh, uh, we also have cotton gin, and I get a lot of feedback from him to raise cotton. So, <laughs> so that's part of it. Uh, uh, seriously, I'm not that, trying to argue against no, it. no, but that that is part of it. Just a propensity to to you know, 50 percent of our productions in cotton, uh, with the with the other 50 percent being split between these other crops. So just from a calculation, you you've got to stay in cotton longer than you do these other crops. Okay. But uh, from a production standpoint, it just seems to fit. I, I like planting cotton behind cotton, and I have fields that I've planted that way for up until recently. We had fields that have been in cotton for 10 or 15 years, no-till, undisturbed. And we were maintaining fairly good yields, uh, but as you saw from the slide earlier, our yields had gone from back around 2000, about 860, 70 pounds, up to where over the last five years, uh, we've averaged about 1,000 pounds. And we, we ex fully expect to be pushing those yields all past that. And that, I think, is partially due to the crop rotation that we're, we're employing since 2000, and, you know, the big cotton year, 2006, cotton wall to wall, and then prices fell and we started planting corn because corn prices went up. And we've seen the benefits of, of, of the rotation in, in higher yields and, and of course weed control and 
and so um, I don't know. That's just that seems to be what fits. Um, and also, it, it goes to try and stay diversified, not having all our acres in one crop, uh, diversifying our risk, and you know you just got to got to move that around. So that's sort of a roundabout answer. You indicated, I think you indicated you tried to kill your cereal land or cereal uh, rye and the wheat when it's about knee high, but is that, is that right? That's, that's yeah, that's picture, about right. The picture of the rye you had, it already ended up looking like a lot larger. What kind of well, it right? was actually, it may have looked like it, but it was probably just above knee high. Oh, okay. It really wasn't that much bigger, uh, but it had headed out. But we plant, we have a, we're, we're very far north. We're right below the Kentucky state line. Uh, when fall gets here, it goes from being harvest to winter just pretty quick. And so if we don't get it in in the month of October, I'm not planting cover crops into, into November. We just don't get the biomass or the stand established. But um, so a lot of times we'll plant them in October and then it turns cold and wet and we don't get a whole lot of a whole lot more growth. Um, and that's you know, that's why we see our, our cereal rye about knee high. It just doesn't get a lot bigger than that. Would, would you say that's, that's your experience? You're further south than we are, Larry. Yeah, it, 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 that's about right. Now, when we blend it with like a bench or something, and it's got nitrogen with it the whole time, it's right. bigger. It'll get, what you had in here? You had a big place on the plus side. I mean, it was every bit up to my shoulder. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, ha we haven't done that. We, we are putting some nitrogen out with it. We fertilize, we put our, uh, if, if I've got potash or dap that needs to go out, we'll uh, put 10, 15 units of nitrogen out or, or let the nitrogen in the dap suffice. But we, so we try to promote that early, you know, that, that early stand establishment, but that's about all we're putting out is 10 or 15 units. I wonder if some years, especially if the Later, that the last cover crop plant is getting late. If you put more nitrogen, it might make a difference. Like this year, maybe because yeah. December was hot, but right. Other December, maybe not so much. Yeah, I, I think that's very possible, and uh, there's uh, all sorts of opportunities to do that. We didn't discuss uh, putting burn down out ahead of the cover crops. We look at our fields, and this year we had real clean fields. We didn't feel like we needed to do any burn down. And I'm not going to spend money where I don't have to. But if I see anything out there coming, we're going to we're going to hit it with a, a dose of Roundup or Gramoxone and, and try to start clean. Um, e even in the cover crops, um, we'll, we'll hit it with something before we plant the cover crops. We do that with our wheat, uh, just any crop. That's our philosophy. But in the fall of the year, if there's nothing there, the field's clean, like going in behind a cotton crop. If there's absolutely nothing there, I'm not going to spend the money on it. Yeah. Um, if we'll either drill, a lot of times uh, we might drill that uh, a little, a little bit more, or or we can broadcast it and hit it with a hit it with that Turbo Max. We we have done some of that, and it works real well. Um, we always go in behind corn and cut our stalks. We mow our stalks. Uh, usually corn is harvested in our area in sometime early September, so we don't plant our cover crops till the 1st of October. You know, there's, there's ample time for re-emergence of pigweed. You know, that all has to be addressed, and, and we have tended to handle that by delaying. Uh, if, we have, if we have any pigweed in our, in our corn, we, we'll let it stand back up, you know, wait a week or so before we mow it, so maybe we get them back up and top them out, and then we go back in and we'll spray it with Gramoxone, and, you know, that, at that time of the year, uh, you know, you, during the summer, that's not going to be very effective, but in the fall, uh, going into a cooler period, uh, it can keep them from going to seed and, and, and seems to be effective, seems to do what we need. So we do look at burn down. We, and, and again, I, you know, I'd say we're 90% no-till, and I, I really believe that in my heart, but if you want to be technical, running this turbo-till maybe violates that. But I'm telling you, 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 could, you would be hard-pressed to decide whether the field had been worked or not if you didn't know. It, it just simply cuts the residue up and lays it on the ground and makes it easier for that planter to penetrate the, the residue and also promotes the breakdown of the, of the residue. 
Good. Well, any other questions for John? Thank you, John. Perfect. Perfect. Appreciate your